Good evening. Uh, I will discuss uh, aspects of transnationalism by mainly exploring uh, the notion of citizenship. Um, citizenship as a concept and also as a practice normatively actually stands for uh, activity in the public sphere, activity in the political field, and it stands for membership in a political community of uh, equals. So this is an aspiration, um, uh, an aspiration within the notion of citizenship that um, we sometimes uh, forget because when we think of citizenship nowadays, we uh, mostly see it as a contested notion for it being reduced to an administrative criterion that is actually selectively um, differentiated inclusion in or exclusion from the nation state membership, from privileged membership of um, Western nation states. Um, I would uh, argue that um, postmodern, so contemporary, also post-democratic societies that are characterized by what could be uh, called the hollowing out of democracy, the hollowing out of democratic um, potential, have actually enthroned citizenship as passport uh, identity. We've, we've um, already heard uh, in uh, James's talk. Um, and this passport, enthroning passport identity, um, seems today uh, it has been reproducing a never so profound differentiation between those with the right passport and those with the wrong one, those from the West and those constituting the rest, those constituting the we and those marginalized as uh, the other. And you know we could uh, go along making the uh, similar analogies. I will now discuss how such differentiation has been uh, reproduced and what it brings. I will call differentiation principles and I will explore basically how nation states have actually enthroned passport uh, citizenship as passport um, identity, how nation states have actually been robbing the, the potential of citizenship from its equality oriented um, aspirations. And if we bring migration into this uh, discussion, looking at how migration is actually managed um, today, how nation states are managing migration, um, uh, one, would, uh, one would observe that migration is predominantly framed or understood as a sabotage. It is understood as an unprecedented breach of bordered uh, territoriality and of uh, a breach of docile uh, labor. Um, so basically, we, we are seeing, uh, when we look at the reactions of the nation state to migration, to mobility, we are seeing that this nexus, migration mobility, um, is actually conceived as a threat to uh, sovereignty. Uh, consequently, the primarily concern of um, holders of power is actually how to make mobile subject um, so-called ungovern, uh, ungovernable uh, subjects, how to make them governed. Uh, govern, uh, so uh, turning um, mobile subjectivities into governed um, individuals, basically this is the way to control uh, mobility. And uh, this is actually also the way to subordinate mobility to fit various nationalist ideologies or labor market uh, productivity goals. I will now discuss uh, these four differentiation strategies that are facilitating such goals. The first strategy uh, can be called categorization uh, of citizenship or categorization of um, people. Taking the example of migration management, we can see how states have produced a meticulous categorization of migrants into various groups. So we have asylum seekers, refugees, illegal migrants, family reunion migrants, undocumented migrants, work migrants, and the list goes on. Some of these categories, when you look at them more closely, have a legal uh, backup. They have appeared as legal categories, and they are, uh, by law, actually used to limit uh, human rights, to limit 
mobility for some of the categories. For example, the case of the category of the refugee or uh, the asylum seeker. On the other hand, uh, we see some of the categories that um, do not necessarily have a legal backing, uh, but that have, however, found widespread legitimization in political discourse and the related public and uh, media discourse, where they function as um, metaphors for migrants, for those over there, for the second uh, uh, for the second class people, for example, the category of an economic migrant or the category of an illegal or an undocumented migrant that is not actually a legal category per se, but has been used widely, firstly in the political and then in the media discourse to, again, to reproduce uh, differentiation. Um, these categorizations, uh, when we look at them, I mean, what, 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 what do they tell us? Uh, they point to prioritization of the status-based citizenship versus what could be called human-based, what could be viewed as human-based uh, citizenship. And by doing so, they're actually grounding the legitimacy on the people's existence on the pre-described statuses, where one's life is actually dependent on uh, uh, the holding of a specific status or the lack of the specific status. Uh, so, by doing so, categorization regimes have actually produced categories of uh, under people who are viewed in the um, words of the rising populist political parties across Europe, but also globally, who have, for example, declared that of multiculturalism as impossible subjects of integration. This is how the uh, mainstream political speech in um, in um, uh, predominant political elite goes. So migrants are being viewed as impossible subjects to be integrated. Uh, they are viewed as such for the described, the ascribed difference, the ascribed um, allegedly different culture, different custom, and so on that uh, obviously does not fit the, the norms of the uh, civilized uh, West. The second differentiation strategy that I want to address uh, can be called the contractualization of uh, citizenship. Let me make an example from migration studies. If a female migrant, a woman migrant, if we look at her, we see that she's dependent on the set of conditions that go along with her specific uh, status. If she seeks asylum, uh, then uh, statistics tell us that she has less than 1% chance to being admitted into a status of uh, refugee. Once uh, getting the status um, of a refugee, uh, the host country, so the state where she currently lives, decides the conditions uh, under which she can work, uh, whether she can work, the, uh, the state defines the conditions if uh, and under what terms um, she can uh, get education and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the system is actually uh, conditioning her life with, you know, with more, with always new, it's been, it's been inventing new and new requirements for her to be, uh, uh, to be finally being able to fit, uh, fit in. But this actually never, never happens. I like this Balibarian notion, you know, once a migrant, always a migrant. So the system has been reproducing the category of, uh, of, um, of migration. As an example, I have, um, thematize the creation of migrants as a wasted uh, precariat, uh, wasted precarity, um, in line with Zig Zygmunt Bauman's notion of the wasted uh, humans, arguing that migrant precarization is orchestrated at the intersection of immigrant status, uh, first, second, the governance of migration and labor, and third, the features uh, of the industry, industries that actually employ migrant workers. We can see that the function of this triangulation, um, the contractual illusionary inclusion of mob mobile populations is actually to create different subjects of labor. This allows nation states to carefully select the wanted from the unwanted um, migrants and uh, we have been seeing a trend globally of channeling migrant labor force into the so-called 3D jobs, so dirty, dangerous, and uh, demanding. 
In these books, we have referred to circular conditionality of a migrant's life that is actually bluntly pointing to what contractualization of citizenship actually means. Uh, without a permit for, for work, you know, it's not possible to obtain a residence permit. If one does not have a residence permit, then your working uh, possibilities are limited. If you don't have a residence permit, you are not admitted to be uh, fit for citizenship. If you don't have a citizenship, then you cannot be part of the medical insurance scheme and so on and so forth. The third strategy of differentiation that I want to discuss um, can be called cre-migration, cre-migration. Um, generally, cre-migration points to the convergence of uh, migration laws and punitive uh, laws. Or in other terms, uh, cre-migration exemplifies contemporary trends of criminalization of uh, mobility. Uh, various strategies can be observed as within this notion of uh, crimigration. Uh, one is strengthening of border regimes, while borders, as I will try to show a bit later, can have very different meanings. One can play around uh, the uh, uh, borders, but historically we can uh, admit that uh, borders have been an institutional mean for safeguarding the rule of uh, exclusion. The territorial borders in this context appear as spaces where differences are reproduced or as spaces where people are divided and sorted. Um, and consequently, borders in this context appear as manifestations of hegemony and its pressure to uh, normali uh, normalization. The power to admit or to exclude non-citizens is inherent in uh, border sovereignty. And lately, if we look at the European context, but also globally, it seems that um, we are witnessing the hysteria of uh, bordering. Uh, for example, rebordering at the sea, uh, building double or triple fences uh, on land, together with soft electronic uh, fingerprint-related uh, bordering um, that are all strategies that are being legitimized as securitization uh, policies. But we clearly speak here uh, of state securitization, um, uh, and the opposite would be human securitization. So borders actually here, by pursuing security uh, and by um, you know, uh, reproducing uh, the dangerous other can appear as a mechanism of institutional racism that uh, is actually eradicating in uh, Rancien's terms the difference between the police and, the dif and, uh, and politics. Politics, policies has becoming uh, policing, basically. Other strategies of bordering include uh, camps detention camps, uh, refugee camps. The map here uh, shows uh, the steep rise in the number of um, foreigners' camps in the last uh, 15 years in a European context. Um, we know that camps have been gentrified, built at the outskirts, uh, usually of life, uh, and that as Foucauldian islands of the fools are usually situated at the outskirts of uh, urban settlements, Often, uh, they do not have internet facilities, the medical care, the legal advice, all these uh, services are um, limited, meaning that individuals who are living there, uh, in a way, have been robbed of their dignity and the camps, the, the, the bordering of the camps, have been uh, living um, people with bare life in um, terms of Giorgio Agamben. And yet, we can see when we look at the political discourse that camps have been celebrated uh, uh, as a solidarity or as assistance of the, global as, of the globalized West, which, um, to put it mildly, is, um, can be viewed as a language uh, uh, manipulation. 
I will move to the third uh, strategy that I want to address of differentiation that uh, can be called uh, externalization of uh, borders. Um, the example is the state agreements. For example, the European Union a couple of years ago has made an agreement with uh, Libya, followed by an agreement with Morocco, or if I mentioned the recent agreement of the European Union and uh, Turkey, according to which Turkey has been keeping in camps um, more than two million people at the doors of the European uh, Union. Here we can see that the EU from the position of the rule maker uh, actually has been colonizing the East and the South as the rule taken by adopting agreements to actually to actually stop mobility or prevent mobility uh, before uh, mobility reaches the borders of the European Union. By now I have mostly addressed the, the political, the legal ways of obstructing transnationalism. Uh, but there is another way uh, which James has also mentioned before uh, that I think is reproducing the outcomes and that is by means of political, by means of media discourse, um, and we are seeing uh, when uh, media are reporting about <coughs> migration, the spec spectacularization of this um, phenomenon largely, which is a, an adopted uh, populist strategy, both um, coming, you know, both being adopted by the political elite and the um, mainstream media. When the political elite uh, of the European Union began to proclaim um, security threat uh, by so-called massive migration in the 2015-2016 during the functioning of the, of the Balkan route, they conveniently uh, operated with the category of an economic migrant. It was interesting to see how uh, he, the masculinity, was very proclaimed here, was symbolizing a threat penetrating the allegedly ethnically homogeneous nation threatening domestic workers, taking away their jobs and social security and so on. While on the other hand, when the EU wanted to show its humanitarian, you know, more solidarity face, then the category of the refugee has been introduced into the, into the discourse. Um, and this category actually uh, had this compassion. Um, at the moment, the discourse was changed. Uh, women and refugee children came into the debate. We need to feed the children, we need to take care of them, but here we saw that the tolerance um, ended. So not hungry anymore. We saw in the political discourse that they should move, uh, move forward or they will be according to the statuses that we have discussed before, um, would be uh, uh, deported. We sympathize, but if I quote Slovenian Prime Minister, our integration capacities are limited. He was saying this and the media have been, um, have been uh, repeating this. In the concluding remarks, I would like to go back to the idea of uh, transnationalism and citizenship. And we can see that both this concept, both these ideas have become in the last 10 or 15 years key words in claims to uh, surp surpass the state-centric perspective on territory, state-centric perspective on the understanding of the state and on uh, human life. Uh, still, we have shown how significant formal citizenship is one fails to fit a specific category when a status is uh, denied. So um, how this reproduces precarity in the hierarchy of unequal um, citizenship uh, market. Transnationalism, I think, has the potential to actually enact and to stimulate a transformative uh, agency, um, I mean, stimulating us to think about the multi-layered uh, subjectivities uh, contesting the idea of uh, scholar identities or of nested, uh, nested identities. And migrants are embodying, I think, this, um, these uh, ideas. I would like to refer briefly to the literature on autonomy of migration that has been put forward uh, about a decade ago. This literature is interesting because it has taught us to view a subject on the move as not as victims, obviously, but as so-called nomads of the present who are 
disrupting certainties, who are breaking the rules, not at least who are you know, crossing uh, the borders, who are rupturing the status quo, and by doing so, uh, who bring actually possibilities for critically rethink um, contemporary situations and also think of future, uh, uh, future aspirations. My uh, Greek colleagues from the MIGNET project, that was a project on migration, internet, uh, and uh, gender, have produced a video game, Banopticon, which stimulates migration situations which take place at um, border crossings or in rural areas in um, cities, but above all which affect uh, human bodies, as we've already heard today. Bodies are actually becoming the subject on which uh, control is applied and bodies today actually remain the basic topos also to counter, to counteract um, uh, control. And these bodies, uh, the trans migrant, the transnational bodies, uh, don't fit obviously the typical um, picture of the victim um, or migrant as a victim or the typical picture of migrant as a perpetrator, as you know, being a violent person that is often reproduced um, in, the, uh, in the political, in the political uh, discourse. Just one minute to stop with, the, with some new concepts that I think are challenging and that are related to the utopias of transnationalism. For example, the, the idea of the mobile uh, commons. Mo mobile commons um, is actually um, addressing mobility populations who are exchanging knowledge on mobility. We are seeing migrants that actually exchange knowledge about border crossings, about routes, they, we see migrant tactics that are escaping surveillance regimes, for example, that are es escaping fingerprinting. Um, we see migrants practicing connectivity by using uh, nanomedia, by, uh, by using various technological uh, devices, as well as mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, strategy, which can, which can embody the notion of the connected migrants, so it's far from, you know, it's far from being migrant being a victim, but is um, producing another set of uh, thinking uh, where we see migrants as active subjectivities that are actually pursuing the idea of world um, citizenship. Uh, Weltbürgerrecht in terms of Immanuel Kant, uh, which is meant to signify uh, a bright not a bright utopia or you know, an, a, an ideal life that is lifted away or that has nothing to do with reality. To the contrary, we can see this trans-migrating um, subjectivity actually reinventing um, what can be seen as worldliness of people, right? Where people are judged by, um, by uh, human security and not by um, nation state security. And now, yes, <laughs> thank you.